Lisa the Painful is not an easy game to talk about. It's a game originally made in RPG Maker that takes heavy influence from Earthbound, but instead of the horror being placed in the subtext, it's more in the forefront. It's also weird. And uncomfortable. Parts of the game make my stomach drop every time. <laughs> and when the game advertises itself as a life-ruining game experience, it might be tongue-in-cheek, but it's not wrong. You could dismiss the game as another Earthbound-inspired indie game about depression, but Lisa stands out for many reasons. First of all, it's hilarious. Genuinely funny, which is astounding, considering that most video games that attempt humour are rarely funny. The humour, along with the low-poly art style, work to offset the harshness of the story. And secondly, it's well written. The dialogue doesn't overstay its welcome, and the smaller text boxes mean that they have to be as efficient as possible. But then again, there is Nern, so maybe not. Lisa is about a man named Brad, living in the post-apocalypse where a mysterious white flash has destroyed the land and wiped out all the women, which has severely destroyed the psyche of the remaining men, to say the least. Due to his upbringing, Brad is an emotionally damaged man who never dealt with his childhood trauma because he never really had the chance. He's addicted to a drug called Joy, which is ironic, since it's not an upper or a downer, it's more of a neutralizer, in the sense that it makes you feel nothing. And in the post-apocalypse, that's too good for Brad to pass up. The title of Lisa refers to Brad's younger sister, who was heavily abused by their father, Marty. And let's just say that the symbolism is not subtle. Brad's guilt over his inability to protect his sister and himself is a burden he's lived with all his life. He uses karate as an outlet, but never properly dealt with his trauma. The post-apocalyptic setting is a reflection of Brad himself. Barren, lifeless, and lacking any hope for the future. Brad is the kind of person who bottles up his emotions, and when they're let out, the result is often catastrophic. <laughs> The story starts with Brad stumbling on a baby, and discovers that the child is a girl. Brad then raises this child in secret, along with his childhood friends, Rick, Cheeks, and Sticky. Brad is hoping to redeem himself for what happened with Lisa and their abusive father, Marty, by protecting the child from the men who inhabit the land. Brad wants to keep her existence as a secret, but the problem is that word travels fast, and Brad's joy addiction is still in full swing, despite his efforts. The child is named Buddy, and she grows up under Brad's care, but her inquisitive nature is quickly cut off by Brad, who does, at very least, try to compromise. After waking up from an alcohol and joy binge, and a strange encounter with a man named Terry Hints, Brad returns to find that his friends have been assaulted and Buddy is missing. With his determination, trauma, and Terry, I guess, he sets out to find him. On his journey, Brad can find new party members, which, to put it bluntly, are a bunch of fucking weirdos. They all have their own fighting mechanics and backstories. Under certain circumstances, they can die. Permanently. 
So if you want to be really cynical, they can be viewed as a resource. The tutorial character Terry, who forces himself into your party, is an interesting guy. For starters, he does basically no damage, has low health, and generally poor abilities. According to the game's creator, Austin Jorgensen, he was designed to be unlikable and useless. So, when given the choice, the player wouldn't feel bad about sacrificing him. And when he found out that the players adored Terry Hints, he stated, I failed spectacularly. Terry is one of the most popular characters, and if you stick it out and level him up, you're rewarded with a really useful skill. Nern is hilarious. He's a historian who just doesn't shut up. He rambles and can't stay on track for any story he tells. Watching his campfire scene is a nightmare unto itself. Harvey is a fish, with legs and a top hat. He's also a lawyer, who, despite living with the fish people, doesn't understand their language. He does a really shitty job of defending Brad in a court case, and then forces himself into the party. There are 30 characters you can use as party members, some more interesting than others, and some more useful in battle. So a bit of metagaming might be required if you're struggling. Apparently Brad is strong enough to solo the whole game, but having a strong party will make the experience a little smoother. Battles are turn-based, and there's a lot more emphasis on status ailments than most RPGs, with the ailments themselves being turned on their head and made more appropriate for the world of Lisa. Some characters like Brad and Rage have a combo system, where you can input sequences to get special moves, and you're rewarded with a bit of extra damage. Certain combinations can be exploited. You can cover the enemy in oil, then follow up with a fire attack for extra damage, lower the enemy accuracy with statuses like crying or pissed, and you can stack several damage over time statuses like poison and bleed. Finding a team that is balanced and has synergies will make the battles much easier. The Joy Drug also plays into this system. Brad and some of the other party members can suffer from Joy Addiction, which will severely lower all their stats until the withdrawal wears off, nor it's satiated with Joy itself. But if you manage to beat the game without taking Joy, you get an extended ending. The world of Olaith is bizarre. Since women are no longer around, men have gone psychotic. The currency is now dirty magazines, since it's arguably one of the few objects with any value. In the post-apocalypse, life is cheap. Literally. For 50 magazines, you can wager a party member in a game of Russian roulette. I'm well aware that it's a video game with fictional characters, but Jesus Christ, this shit makes my stomach drop. Both competitors' trigger pulls are performed with your button press, and even though you know it's coming, it still feels horrible. <laughs> The game often uses these kind of jump cuts. You might be exploring an area and the background music is relatively calm. Then you enter a bar and you're assaulted by low fidelity hissing and coughing. The world is letting you know that at a moment's notice, your circumstances can change in an instant. To trick the game uses almost like a jump scare, but it's not as cheap. Just around the corner, you might be forced into a hard choice, which will have permanent consequences. The soundtrack is incredible. If you watch any of my videos, I use this OST constantly. I have no idea what you would call this genre-wise. Maybe... Nightmare Electro Trip Hop? Who knows? 
The campfire scenes that are added in Definitive Edition give us a little more insight into Brad and his companions. Some have quirky events. <laughs> Or a character will go off and do something personal. One is about the current state of professional wrestling. And the others are surprisingly hard-hitting payoffs. The standouts being Brad confiding something in Terry. Queen's analysis of Brad's sexuality. Bo Wyatt's lament over his lack of musical skill. Mad Dog revealing that he might just be the worst person in the entire game. Also, that wrestling one. It's a goddamn masterpiece. Amen, brother. In fact, there's a ton of wrestling references in the game, if you're into that. Like me. A scummy guy. Um, a lot of, you, know. you think it's fake? What's that? Is that fake? Huh? What the hell's wrong with you? That's open hand slap, huh? Well, let me tell you something, brother! The definitive edition also adds a new optional dungeon and a mega boss, which all take place within Brad's mind. This whole section is a fucked up fever dream. And your reward for beating it is a little more context about the relationship between Brad, Marty, and Lisa. It explains why Brad is carrying a wilted flower around. And much like the main game, it hits pretty damn hard. Be careful though, the boss has this mechanic that involves permanently killing your party members, which I didn't realize. I do have a few nitpicks. I think it's easy to get lost, especially in the early areas. Some sort of pause menu map would be appreciated. The audio levels could use a bit more compression. Certain attacks will fucking pierce my eardrums. Also, it didn't happen too many times, but if you fall off a cliff, that's an instant game over. Which, once again, very annoying, but extremely appropriate given the game's tone. So, Brad ventures out to get Buddy back. But on his way are several obstacles, like rocks, warlords, and people from Brad's past, like Buzzer, a childhood sweetheart of Lisa, who clearly blames Brad for what happened to her, and now lives to torment him by any means necessary. But the biggest obstacle is Brad's mind, which will always remind him of how he could not protect Lisa. And now he's failed Buddy. If you look at the party members in the status screen, they all have Final Fantasy style jobs. Barbarian, Bowman, Lawyer, Sports Entertainer. Brad's job? Brad finds out that his childhood friends, who Buddy saw as her uncles, were the ones who sold her out. They planned on giving her to Rando, a towering warlord who was actually a former karate student of Brad's. They believed that it was the right thing to do to ensure the survival of the human race, but they also wanted a large payout for it. Brad takes this personally, to say the least. As you play through the game, it becomes glaringly obvious that Brad is not fit to be a parent, or a surrogate parent, or even a guardian. The tragedy is that his trauma blinds him to this fact, and by the time he realizes it, it's too late. Brad moves heaven and earth to get Buddy back, but in the process starts to resemble his abusive father Marty. Buddy herself makes it abundantly clear that she now wants nothing to do with Brad, and she blames him for all the horrible things that have happened to her. Brad's quest consumes him, and after finding dynamite, building boats, killing warlords, and tracking down Buddy, he runs into his father Marty, who has survived somehow, and he's looking after Buddy. He seems genuinely remorseful for what happened to Brad and Lisa. You're given a choice, as a player to forgive Marty. The only problem is that it's not the player's choice. It's Brad's. And he can never forgive Marty.
Brad is so determined to save Lisa that even an army and his own party members are not enough to stop him. All the party members have their own final message to Brad, and the fight itself, much like the Russian roulette section, make me very uncomfortable. At this point, the effects of the joy drug are coming full circle for Brad, giving him great strength in return for his humanity. With his last breath, he approaches Buddy with one request. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 